So the question that's on the lips of every student, is university just a scam? Find out that and more in today's episode of the Polonize Podcast. Let's jump in. All right, Sharab, here we are. Hey, Mars, how you doing? Doing good. I'm super pumped. This is yeah. going to be a fun discussion. Me too. I'm very <laughs> pumped. <laughs> I can, I can feel the fire in us, so this is going to be a good one. T- tell me what this. we're doing today. Tell us well, what we're doing today. Today, as, as we mentioned in the intro, we're pulling apart the idea of uh, is university a scam? University is, is a scam. Is a scam. <laughs> <laughs> You've confirmed that we could just we could just kill the episode now. Then. <laughs> no, it's it's an important question. We've been talking about it quite a lot with our polonizers, our players on our platform, which are majority university students. Uh, it comes up a lot in conversations here in Upside, where, where we are. This idea that uh, there's a, there's a general dissatisfaction with with the process of of university itself, and uh, just to sort of have a look at some of those numbers, especially here in Australia, and they're quite staggering. So the average hex debt, so hex is the the program uh, of student loan, student loan yeah. uh, here in Australia, which is ha- has its equivalent all over the world. So the average debt is is actually quite is low in Australia compared to other places in the world. It's twenty four thousand seven hundred seventy one in in twenty twenty two. 10% of all debtors have a debt more than 50K and and there's a staggering 2.9 million people with a hex debt. So those yeah. numbers are just phenomenal in themselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. there's so much money being spent in the world right now in education. So much money. Yeah, and our what we're proposing here is that when you look at it, there's no other way you can put it. It's a scam because you're not – If you the way I look at it, if you look at if you look at it as an investment, which a lot of people do, they look at university as an investment. It's as volatile as crypto is at the moment. <laughs> like if you're going to go invest in university or crypto, you'd probably go crypto. Probably go crypto. <laughs> so let's tear that apart and really look at that from a univer- from a university student's perspective. One. But always thinking about this from the perspective of the students because they're the majority of our players. Talking to them, you know, yeah, this exactly. is how we find out. We're, it's yeah. not us. Yeah, and that's what we've done. We've asked, we've polled a lot of our players on our platform to ask them. Uh, what are the problems they're facing? What are the questions they have? And they've come up with some good ones. So yeah. let's um, let's let's frame this discussion in that in that sense. All right, mm. fantastic. Uh, I've got a whole bunch here. Yeah, you know, and they're they're all they're all different types of questions, but they're all problems that people have with the university, with the university experience, with the value of university, and with their feeling of why am I here? You know. Mm. So before we go into the specific problems, I do think that that's one big question that sits above them. And my personal experience, I did three university degrees more than two decades ago. So things are different now. But even then, I remember having that feeling. And this is not as easy for me to reflect on. In some ways, I was very much committed to the university system. A personal note, I come from a family of lecturers, teachers and professors way back. All the way on my mother's side and my father's side. My father is a 55-year semi-retired professor at a top university here in Melbourne. And interestingly, I spoke to him about these questions last night and he agreed with all of them. And I thought that was really, really interesting. So, all right, why am I here? Let's let's start. Let me fire a few. Let me, let me fire a few. This is a very common one. Let's Let's start with skills. Let's talk about skills first of all. I remember thinking this, what I'm learning in class, how is this relevant to my life? I know that this is not going to be something I'm going to need in my job, in my research, in my work going forward. So why am I learning this skill? Now, specific example, in computer science, we end up learning computer programming languages and patterns and techniques from 10 or 20 years ago in a field of of endeavor, which is literally changing month by month, week by week. Yeah. Especially in AI now. It's crazy. Mm. Like we have to educate ourselves every single day to stay relevant as developers. The university curriculum changes, what, every few years, if you're lucky. I had this back in my time. I was learning something called Pascal. Pascal was invented back in the 70s or 60s as a research language. Um, I spent hours learning Pascal. And I've never written a line of Pascal code in my life. <laughs> now that's only worse now. 
And it's across all fields. It's not just computer science. Yeah, so that's like that's the equivalent of learning guitar for three years and then just putting it away and going to play percussion in a band or <laughs> something like that. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Look, some people say, oh, but you're learning, you're learning deeper concepts and it doesn't wash because the, you spend so much time on these particular skills in university, especially in the technical side. Students feel this all the time. Mm. Uh, on that, I, I've got a, a quote here that I want to read which is relevant to this. So this is on the Y Combinator uh, Hacker News, which is kind of like, I guess, where all the, where all the Y Combinator uh, students hang out. I'll just read the first couple of lines of this. So it's actually titled University is a Scam. Uh. And so this guy's like, I feel so bitter. I just graduated one month, one month ago. I could have continued with, with my master's, but I'm, I'm done. I hated every second of being in university, not because of any other reason, but because of how bleak my financial prospects was. I consider myself lucky that my parents bankrolled me, but looking at the aggregate amount I spent on it, 60,000 pounds. I paid 60,000 pounds to literally read a bunch of books and write some code that could run on a computer from the 1980s, which I could have done on my own from my parents' basement for free. Yeah. Pretty this much is the same exactly, way exactly. Mm -hmm. Computer science, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Uh, I taught myself computer programming from the age of 12 to 18. I then did four years of computer science at a global top 50 university and I learned more as a teenager than I did at university. I was scammed. <laughs> or my parents were scammed, more to the point. Or actually I've paid it back as a student loan, so yeah. I've, I've been scammed. I like that. That, that felt deep. I'm, I was scammed. <laughs> I was scammed. I've been scammed by university. I did three degrees. Look, I loved university. I didn't hate it. But the reason I loved it was the social aspect. Oh, that's, yeah. that's one point I want to touch on here because as of you know two years ago, I would, I would still argue that university was worth it purely for the social angle. But now even speaking to a few of the students uh, – few of the pollinizers, they've said exactly that. They they don't they don't have to go to lectures, so they do most of it online. They and, and they're they're basically scrolling on their phone even when they're watching their lectures, multitasking, doing other things. So the social element has totally been taken out of yeah. university post COVID. So that's not even a positive of why you should be coming. That's right. Here. And that was the one reason, you know, <laughs> going and the energy and the going to orientation, meeting new people. Students have massively missed that. And we had a comment just the other day from one of our uh, top pollinizers at Melbourne University who said, well, I don't go to lectures, but also I can watch the video and learn better with the video anyway. So it's actually rational not to go to lecture. I can rewind the video and maybe I can watch it in my own time, etc." So the one thing that was keeping university attractive, the social aspect has, has gone now. And it's the one thing about the product for the last 20 years as it's been getting more and more, you know, less and less market fit, if you like. That's the one thing that kept – and so now this is crisis point, right? Mm. So related question uh, or related problem that comes up with this huge disruption, decentralised learning and remote learning is a massive disruptor to universities, one of the key drivers to what's happening now. And it's got a number of effects. One is the social aspect – but the other aspect here is um, the remote experience is actually very boring and disengagement is very, very high. Uh, and because there's no sense of presence and you can't see and feel the other students, it's very easy to switch off. So why do you think that, that – why is that remote experience – so boring you know mm. well, like why is it so boring actually it's a it's a good it's a good question i think part of it is because you're you're being forced to learn something in a in a certain way that you might not necessarily want to learn it as opposed to other things you do on your own uh, learning wise in on computer like you can go down a youtube rabbit hole mm. and spend three four hours easily looking at something that you like even if it might be related to that topic you're studying at university, but you choose your own adventure through the information and you learn it the way you want it 100%. And from the people you want it. Yeah. Very different experience. 100%. And you, th you've just preempted my next problem mm. statement here because why can't I learn the way I want to learn? Mm. Why can't I choose my own adventure? And why can't I learn very, very fast when I'm capable of that? 
You could learn quantum physics in half a day if you have the mindset of learning autonomously using technology. That's the value of technology. In some ways, universities have adopted technology and given you the worst of both worlds. You've got none of the autonomy and independence and exponential potential of the technology, but you've got the disconnectedness of the technology. So you're stuck in actually the worst possible situation. The worst of both worlds. Worst of both worlds. <laughs> University, the worst of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> Look, YouTube is a, great, is a great analogy. I've got teenage kids. I watch them learn on YouTube. I, 100%. They will learn quantum physics. They can learn quantum physics from – I've seen it in front of my eyes. I'll sit down with my son and we will learn physics together. There's better ways of doing that and that's part of the innovation but already that's – a game experience where I am independent and I'm making choices and I'm free. That's a fundamental point here. Universities are top down. They tell you what to learn. Mm. That's not a game. That's work. Yeah. There's a fundamental thing we're getting at here, which I think we should explore around uh, the, the idea of these institutes moving so slowly and that being a, a part of the problem. Uh, you mentioned something this morning that they're – this, that your father mentioned actually about some uh, governmental initiative or there's some committee they're putting in place to to look at, at university and how it's changing. Uh, tell us a bit about that before we move on. Yeah, there's a recognition all around the world from universities and even policy level that education is being broken in front of our eyes, the thing we talk about. And that's manifesting as quite a, quite a few top-down initiatives. So here in Australia I believe there's a uh, – uh, a, a, some sort of committee being put together at that top government level to look at education reform. That's the terminology. Um, now, that's going to be a very slow process. It's going to be top down. It's going to be done by people who don't understand the students uh, because they're not students, you know. And uh, we'll probably have solved a lot of these problems by the time they even put out the report. Yes. <laughs> That's all we care about. That's our passion. That's what we're doing every single day now is spending time with the students and not just asking them about problems, solving their problems mm. 100% of the time, not writing reports about it. Now, here's a key point. Why can't you solve that within a university? Why can't a university change itself and become a great product? You might ask that question. Why are we, why are we saying it's a scam and, and, and stepping outside the model? Because... The problems we're talking about are features of the model. They're not things that are happening within the university space which are easily fixed. They're fundamental aspects or features of the model. So to solve these problems, you have to create a new model. You can't change the existing model because the model itself is the problem. Mm. And speed is one of them. So my related problem statement here that often comes uh, in feedback is especially in technology, students know that what they're learning won't be relevant in three or four years when they come out of university. They, they, they understand that. They get that that skill is being obsoleted and new skills are, and, and new platforms and new things are being created all the time. And they know that universities don't respond to that. Curriculums don't change mm. fast And we enough. saw that. That's at the crux of the problem. We saw that report come out from a IBM this, uh, this week – which was talking about within this three years, 40% of the workforce is going to need to reskill because of AI. So that means that they, they're, as an organization, they're reprioritizing what's important to them on that, on that basic skill level because it's changing so quickly. Yeah. So in three years, their, their organization is going to look very different than it does today. And so how can someone coming out of university even be ready for that change if they move so slow? You can't. And huge red flag, by the way, in that report uh, – the appetite for what's called STEM skills, which are technical skills like computer programming, 40% down to less than 30% in just three years in that survey. So less and less are employers saying we want a great computer programmer and that's just going to carry on. So even at a very fundamental level, why am I here? Again, rears its head like why am I doing this four-year degree based on skills and curriculum put together a decade ago when I know deep, deep down that I'm going to come out into a world which doesn't value those skills and sees less and less value in my degree. It's a, 
it's a declining asset or in crypto terms it's um, a bear market for the education degree right now. It's, you know, you're not, this is not a good time to be investing in that piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. And on, on that point, uh, there was a great interview that I saw from uh, Emily Chang uh, of Blue, Bloomberg who was speaking to Sam, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, and illustrates uh, that at that top level organizations that, that are at the forefront of, um, of th- these changes and how they implement this. She asked him, uh, what 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 should kids be studying these days? And he answered resilience, adaptability, high rate of learning, and creativity. 100%. And then he said and familiar familiarity with the AI tools. So that was just like that was just like yes, someone's actually speaking a language. They're the skills you need. They're the base human skills you need, of which you can build any other skill on top of. Yeah, and we credentialize and we train those skills in polonize that exactly those words Mm -hmm. those are the creds those are the things you go to the polonize platform look look at the first tournaments we have they're all about these things Mm -hmm. these are what the kids the the students are training through our platform it's a bit of a no-brainer if you think about it that way and the existing models that just cannot adapt so there's only one thing to do we have to create a new model you know on that speed thing and, and and on that um on that aspect around skills, um, I want to step into what I think is very related to it, which is people. You know, you can have all the plans in the world, but if you don't have the right team, we all know you can't execute those plans. And I do remember thinking that in university, the teachers and the lecturers and the professors who are teaching me they don't have these skills hmm. either. <laughs> so how can they teach me? So this is another problem that comes up. Yeah, for sure. Actually, just yesterday we were speaking with someone here at Upside and he was saying that he, in his third year of uni, he got a job teaching first year uni students architecture. Yep. And so it was just loop of well, what's happening here. So you're yeah. learning of someone that's not actually practicing yep. architecture. You've learned something and then you're teaching it to someone else that's coming. Yeah. It, it's just it's yeah. the wrong kind of cycle. You're supposed to yeah. be learning from from the best, the people that, that have their hands in the mud and getting dirty with the profession, not someone that's learning of someone that's learned of someone else that's learned of a book. That's, yeah, that's I mean, not- look at sport. You know, the best football coaches are ex-players mm. who have the respect of the team. They know that he's a legend and they want him to be the coach. Mm. Uh, not exclusively, but often. Now, that's only accelerating the, what you're what you're talking about there, and so even more. And I have a lot of sympathy for the staff and lecturers in universities. They're caught up in this failing model just as much as anyone else, and they're not having a great experience either. So this is not a this is not trying to put down the people who are really trying hard to make this model work, but they're in the wrong place, in the wrong model. And they themselves want to also learn and I just want to point that out. Here in Australia recently uh, there's been a lot of focus on the school age population. This has been driven by some very, very poor test scores that are now coming out around what's called the NAPLAN which is our version of an SAT or standardised testing. Our NAPLAN scores in Australia are going down and down and down and something like a third of kids are not able able to basically basically read and write. At what level is that? And it's like primary school and high school level. So okay. it's a little bit below where we normally look at it, polonized, but it's only a few years off mm. the, the people who end up coming, poli- from. Yeah, coming exactly. into university. Yeah. Yeah. And one of, the key, um, one of the key conclusions of this that came out in the media is that the teachers themselves have lost literacy and numeracy. And so they're not able to teach, and I've seen this myself, I've seen, I've seen that the teachers don't have the science knowledge and literacy uh, to, to teach my son. For example, I've, I've written about that. They don't know enough maths to go with my son where he wants to go in maths. So it's uh, not surprising to me that the brightest students in architecture are teaching the first year architecture students. Um, and this uh, this is actually a, touching on the next the next question or problem here around around people, which is uh, does my does my teacher, my professor, my lecturer really get me mm. understand me there's a connection problem there too um let me give you a little example here kids and young people nowadays spend a lot of time gaming that's not because they're lazy and waste time it's because gaming gives them the experience that they want 
based around those game principles that we often talk about. And yet we've experienced ourselves that at the staff or administration level of institutions, there's a real resistance to the idea of gaming and thinking like a game and teaching like a game and so on. So I, I do think there's a connection and empathy thing here that is a problem statement as well. Like if you're learning from someone who you feel like fundamentally doesn't understand you, then you can't you can't learn. The teacher and the student must have an empathetic connection. Mm. That illustrates that point that there's the anchor of where people are learning from is incorrect. That, that in that top down model, everything's being imposed from the level above. So the student be, is being imposed on by the teacher. They're being imposed imposed on by a curriculum, mm. and that's that, that's all in this model of standardization because. We need to have a cookie cutter model to evaluate one person against the next. So at least that's the theory. So that entire process is is breaking down also. Yeah, yeah. And w- we know how to do it, do it right. You, We still have competition. We credential, we compare, but it's bottom up from the skills. And then people get to put them together like Lego. That's a real game. Not telling you what you're going to do for the next four years of your life. I mean, there is no other sphere in life where you pay money to get told what you're going to do for four years in your life. (laughs) Unless you're into that. (laughs) It's a masochistic thing, isn't it? Um, Yeah, so there's there's another problem question I hear a lot and you were just talking about, uh, I think you have a story specifically around this, why am I spending all this money? That's a big one. You know, £60,000, $50,000, $100,000. Education has some of the highest price points of any product on earth. And you're investing in a declining asset, even at the Ivy League level, you know. Uh, You look at the numbers of how many employers, top employers care about degrees, it's just declining. Mm. Less and less and less. And there's so many examples of this. Even IBM talks about it. Yeah, Elon Musk himself has talked talked about this and... There's an in- interesting section here to talk about diving into the psychology of that debt because that that drives a lot of issues within the, the community and within a family unit. Uh, like that that guy said in that example, he got bankrolled by his parents, mm. sixty thousand pounds. Now that means their parents have invested sixty thousand pounds into into this this poor poor guy who spent four years of his life doing something that he now hates and he hasn't learnt the skills to get out and actually participate authentically in something that he that he loves in in the work environment hasn't prepared him for what he's for what he has to do so so the psychology of that's interesting so now you've got an individual that feels indebted to their parents which which we do normally they've brought us up there's there's that but now you add to that this $60,000 debt then they go out and they're forced to now have to make a decision about how they work or what they choose to do because not uh, not only are they thinking about that frame in what do I want to do and what's going to fulfill me as an individual, that they're thinking I need to pay off this debt and I need to get a job as quickly as possible. And so you see it, you see it a lot. Grads are working at, at Macca's, they're working at, you know, at Kmart and Coles because they they need money in order to pay off this debt. So what have we done there? We haven't done we haven't achieved anything there. If not, we've just enslaved our youth into a system that's not serving them. Hundred percent. And this is hugely relevant to the Indian community. I'm an Indian, I'm a Bengali Indian. We come from a tradition that really respects education. And it was very influenced, by the way, by that British system of education. They set up these schools and they're still the top schools in India. So there's a history to this. And whole generations of Indian students have come out and become what we call doctors and engineers. It's a joke we have, you know, amongst the Indian diaspora is in traditional way of thinking families wanted their kids to become doctors and engineers. And if you were smart, I still remember even for me as a second generation migrant, I topped my, my high school. The first thing was you're going to become a doctor. It was just an assumption. You, you go to medical school. By the way, I hate being a doctor and I don't want to be a surgeon, but it doesn't matter. Just do it. And that's part of that sunk cost fallacy of like we've invested in you and South Asian and Asian cultures invest massively in their kids. It's a beautiful thing. It's because they love their kids and they invest in the future. But it's been now turned into this Ponzi scheme where investing in that kid to go to Harvard, to get that degree, to get a leg up and then have that high paying job for life and then they repeat it all over again with their own kids. But now it's breaking down. The investment isn't paying back. And so what's really interesting to me is the 
the new generation of Indians coming through very, very, very different to me when I was going through. Mm. They don't want to become doctors and engineers unless they love that. That's fine. But they don't see that the pathway ha- is set for them in that static way. They don't feel that I, – I'm sure there's still that psychology there of I want to pay back what my parents have invested in me, especially those who are sent overseas. That's still very much part of the narrative. But huge numbers of them, and I see this in our polonizers, have entrepreneurial mindsets. So there's this big third way which is uh, startup founder, entrepreneurship, I could build the next big thing and, and really pay back in a massive way. But I think that's a huge thing that I've noticed in, in this particular community especially. Mm. Well, now you're that generation. Now you're the parent. You you have mm. kids. And so ha- how has your perspective changed on the concept of university? I know we've spoken about this before that uh, uh, through Polonize and through training with AI, you've helped your son uh, get in top – Top five, ten percent of um, of top one percent, top two percent. Yeah, but that's in high school. Yeah, this this has really changed my my viewpoint. You've mm-hmm. seen this journey as we've worked together on building this venture. We've, I've gone from someone who would never have done a podcast saying university is a scam five years ago, but now I really, I've really come come around to a totally different way of thinking by just observing what's happening. Um, so but, let, but it's also – it is a timing thing. You know, yeah. I think things are coming to a crisis point. So let me ask you when your boys – when your two boys get to university age, what, what what's your advice it's, to it's them? It's really interesting, isn't it? Because as a parent you still have that status game in your head. Mm. So there's that, still that voice that says, ah, oh, my son went to Harvard. It's still a thing. You know, you say that to anyone on the street, my son's at Harvard. They're like, oh, well done. You know, mm. you guys are – especially in my culture, in the Indian culture. Um, so – that's the wrong reason to send your son to Harvard or to have that aspiration though because you want to boast about your son going to Harvard. But let's be real. That's why a lot of families do it. Okay, so let's, <laughs> let's, let's continue that thought, that, that boasting about the top university that you've been in. How does that then permeate the rest of work culture? Mm. Like I, I, I see it uh, when I look on LinkedIn. You know, mm. it's, it's one of the most prominent things you read, whether it's under the person's name or to the right of their... Yep of their profile it's what university they've gone to so how does what is the status game there is it an assumption that because you've gone to harvard you're better than other people is that the is that the basis basis assumption look i think it's based on something that used to be much more rational historically which is if you've been through a selective and competitive process then you have demonstrated something you've demonstrated performance and the ability to win in a competitive process. It's just that the game you're winning at now is totally irrelevant to the future. But that game of going through and and being very highly skilled at academics and exams, which is basically how you get to Harvard, is a a marker of real skills. There are real skills in there, you know, and there was a time when those those systems were first set up where I think they had a lot more resonance in society people weren't questioning them at all in the 20th century so i would say at that level it's it's interesting and complicated it's not as black and white as saying that that whole status game has no value because humans are status animals and we have a status way of thinking and we are inherently competitive that's Mm -hmm. who we are and performance is a real thing some of the things that you do to get to Harvard are transferable to the future but I would say less and less of them. Some of them are hard work, the ability to concentrate, um, initiative, self-motivation, etc. And I experienced that going through the system and uh, I'm grateful for that. I never, I never think for example that all the hard work I did in studying and learning how to write and read and like that's stuff that's really been important in my life. But you don't need to go to Harvard to get that anymore. Mm-hmm. And what about all the other stuff that you're getting, which is starting to become increasingly toxic, and that is the status game and the the uh, unfairness of that game, essentially. Mm. You know, the unfairness of saying, "Here's a leg up for life" because you've got that degree. It's it's not right. Mm. And so w- within that, the to, to to break open that idea of universities is a scam. 
is it worth it purely on the status alone? So having that piece of paper to say that I went to Harvard or, or, or Melbourne Uni, for instance, here in Australia, which is the best uni- university in Australia or considered the best university in Australia, is that status game even worth it in the wild? In, and the, the little the aspect I can see there, we're in the middle of a, our, our second raise at the moment and looking around that, that uh, venture capital side of the industry where you're looking at founders and they're, you know those founders, one from Harvard, one from Princeton, that, that kind of thing, you, you know, that, that even though it's not spoken about, it, it definitely holds weight uh, because of maybe prior, mm. prior experience of founders being successful from those universities. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about that and that, I guess that's the question out of this is, is, it, is a degree worth it alone for the status of it? Look, when The Economist, which is a very conventional publication, when The Economist puts out a cover story like they did this weekend saying, was your degree worth it? And when they conclude that largely no, then you know the change is afoot. When The Economist (laughs) starts speaking in that way. The status payback, if you like, of having that degree is on the decline massively and... You can just see it in the data. See, if if the world was packed, if the high-performance individuals and companies in the world were all graduates of these top universities, as I think at one point perhaps they were, you know, and especially in America, which is the epicenter of this, uh, then you could make a rational argument that, well, actually, no, that this is what matters. But we know that the top companies and founders who are really making a change in the world do, do not correlate to top university graduates anymore. So the data is clear in that sense. If you want to make an impact, this is not neither here nor there. Mm. You know? Not saying that going to Harvard is a bad thing necessarily, but you don't need to go to Harvard to make an impact on the world. The things you need are completely independent of that. Now, is there a status game? Absolutely. Is that based on history? Absolutely. That's why in Silicon Valley it's a, it's still a thing. Mm. You know, uh, That's why it's, it exists in other parts of the world as well but speak to the sam altman speak to the elon musks ask ask them what they think of a university degree these are the most successful business people of today they're the henry fords of today you know Mm. and they'll tell you and then most critically speak to the kids speak to the students do they feel value that's part of the problem we're seeing especially here in australia we have a massive industry of bringing over students from uh, india asia uh, to study in our universities and that's that I have a problem with that, especially in this frame of is university a scam? Because essentially, what they're doing is bringing students to Australia on the on the proviso or with the with the, with the idea that we've got some of the top. I think we've we've got in Melbourne three of the top fifty universities in the world. So just on those stats alone, families are sending their kids here hmm. to study at these universities. Uh, what I'm worried about is, and, and those prices they're playing are very, the international students oh, pay are very huge. different. The, the family the, will save up for hundred percent, and they're you know? very different to what local students pay. And, and mm. so, so you have a whole different layer of scamminess in 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 this because you're 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 bringing these children over. And I, um, in a prior uh, in my prior life as as <laughs> as, 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 as a musician, I, I worked with my partner Netta, and she was running workshops and performances at. Melbourne Uni, mm. and we we would see these, you know, we'd we would go probably four to six times a year mm. of, for all the different in- intakes of students, and we would run workshops, uh, drumming workshops with them, and then at the end of the week we'd do a performance. And for some of these kids, like these kids, it was the first time they went to a concert, you know, and you'd see, you could see the different the difference in some of these students. You could tell some of them were there to just suck in the experience at whatever whatever they could. They they just they just sucked it up. And but there was a big portion of them you could see that they they didn't want to be there at all. They got they must have got sent here by their family. They were disconnected from culture. They were in a in a very strange land for the, for the wrong reasons. Totally yeah. disconnected. That's what I what I worry about. That sort of disconnection of uh, go to a foreign country to 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 learn something from a university. 
th those international students who I worry about the most. Yeah, about. look, there's, there's a lot to unpack in there. First of all, the rankings of universities, and my father pointed this out yesterday, primarily research-based. They're not getting ranked on are they teaching and giving students a good experience. That is not what they're ranked for. They're ranked for research. It's a completely different thing. And the value of university as research organisations is a completely different question where I have a very different opinion. But in terms of the business, absolutely. And I think privately almost everyone in the education industry itself will, would agree with you. It is a scam in that sense. However, it runs a market which has demand. Now that market is changing and you'll see now that you're starting to get the students wanting much, much more. The days of them just coming over and being grateful to emig emigrate or so on to a so-called first world developed country, those days are behind us. The gap between these countries is changing now. The opportunities back home are hugely manifest compared to what they were 20 or 30 years ago. And that arbitrage between like us, we've got a big pool of people who just want to get to Australia. We can run it for another five or 10 years, but I guarantee it's not going to last. What people want now is a good experience and value. And that question is coming up again and again mm. in our in our student conversations and that's exactly where it's at that's why we're here because they're questioning it they're saying yeah i've paid a lot of money to be here to read books and watch lectures at home in a in a little flat which i can barely afford and then drive an uber the rest of the time why am i here what am i doing and what am i doing the incentive structure there is totally backwards so you're 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 paying up front a massive amount for an experience that you've had no uh, no experience of you, you're going in totally cold. You ex what other business does that? No, exactly. <laughs> what other <laughs> gates the experience? Where else would start? you put up with? It? And this is yeah. where the you know the inertia of ex of education being mm. something of inherent value and having such a sort of status associated with it in those cultures. That's actually why this market is able to run in such an inefficient and unfair manner because education in and of itself is seen as highly highly attractive regardless of what it delivers the quality of the product traditionally but it's changing now and uh universities must feel this and that's why you know the the government of australia is putting together high level discussions around education reform it's becoming very 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 urgent mm -hmm. it's not something that can be put off uh but it won't happen from inside it'll happen because of People like us. Mm. And to get to the crux of this debate is really the question of which we've seen time and time again from our polonizers is uh, will this university degree get me a job? That's that's what they want to know. Uh, when we went to that, uh, that CISA event, one of the questions we heard most was do you offer paid internships? That was mm. a massive thing for international students. Uh, they, they wanted their foot in the door. They wanted the, to... The ability to experience that and that was an interesting way for us to really understand how we felt about about that so someone's coming to you and saying i want a paid internship how do i know mm. if you how do i know your skills against the next person's skills at that point in time there's nothing that tells me you could look at grades but there's nothing there's nothing for me as a potential employer to understand which one of these per per people is a, is a fit for me and Nothing. our business? Those seven top skills that employers look for on that IBM study, not a single one appears on an academic transcript anywhere. They're all invisible. They're not trained at university. They're not learned systematically. They're not credentialized. The gap is enormous and it's getting worse. And we're solving it. That's part of what we're doing. Also, the... The, the fundamental motivation there of wanting opportunity. This is why universities exist now. Uh, there is the research side and there are always people who say human knowledge and innovation need to advance and for that there's this thing called a university to do research at. That's fine and I believe in that. But it's a small proportion of the population that engages in that. We know that. The vast bulk of students and the business of university is about opportunity, clear as day. And if the university is not delivering opportunity, they're not operating as a business and delivering value. They're not right now. They're not delivering opportunity. And those job fairs are archaic in the way they run. You're walking around handing your resume or maybe your LinkedIn profile nowadays 
to a bunch of employers and then waiting for some sort of weird opaque process to happen. You may or may not get called at some future point in time. No visibility, no autonomy, uh, anxiety, you barriers if you're an international student around you know what you can and can't do. Uh, it's an it's a maze for these kids, and you can see it, you know, and that's why they're going to these job fairs. And like some of them can navigate it if they're super superstars, or if you're lucky. Um, the whole process is is broken, and this goes into hiring, and this goes into talent, and and other things too. But this is where I think it reaches its most crisis point. This generation, let's call them Generation Z, or the one after them, Generation Alpha who comes out into the workforce after going through this education, archaic education pro- process and then finds that they can't get jobs, they can't do the things they want to do and they're not equipped for it, that's the crisis point right there. Mm. That's that's the moment that you've got to solve that first and then all the other things. Yeah, great. And now our thesis as Polonize, we see that the antidote to – this whole thing is actually collapsing those things together. It's bringing together education, gaming, talent, work, all those things together. The, thing, the best parts of all those together in the, one, in the one package because of that user experience from both sides of the market but particularly from the student side of the market. As you said, if you, if you have that autonomy, you know what you want to learn and that's, that's being trained with uh, a very quick engaging feedback loop you're seeing instantly how you're ranked against other players. So you know your performance against against those players. You can train against the AI to train those specific core skills that you need. And then you're moving up and you're seeing your progression. That's that's very empowering as a student, isn't it? 100%. And through that process, you're already getting embedded into real mentors, real people in business, um, people who can help you, not just your university lecturer who's never worked in the outside world perhaps, so all of the aspects of, as you pointed out, these different fields coming together, but that's not our decision. The, the reason they need to come together is that the students are themselves synthesizing those worlds into their lives. They don't see the traditional separations between education and work. They want continuous learning in their life. They don't want to finish their degree, walk out, never learn again. They, they don't see the distinction between work and outside of work and technology, for example. They want to have that same amazing experience they have when they play a game. They want that kind of technology in work. Why should they have to come to work and fire up this horrible, the archaic forms-based thing and, and, and use this university portal and download PDFs when they know they can do everything 20 times faster over here, you know. Mm. So these are all examples of them breaking down the barriers. So the barriers are being broken by the students. Mm. It's up to us now to create the platforms for them so they can, we can fit to them. It's not the other way around. Yeah, that point of continuous learning I think is at the crux of it because what you're saying there is that there shouldn't be a delineation from where education stops and work starts. They're actually actually should run in parallel you should be able to continually learn as you're applying those skills uh, and but but it's the it's the application of those skills in the real world that creates the learning Mm. because I, i mean i know as a as an employer if i were to look at a digital marketer for instance and i had someone in i had a resume in front of me that said spent four years at university of melbourne studying digital marketing or someone else that just said spent four years in my basement experimenting with digital marketing check online. out my channel you know yeah check out my I've channel exactly Fifty thousand followers yeah. whatever here's, yeah. here's here's my cousin's hairdresser that i did some marketing for and you know i would always 100 percent, always choose the experience over this over the study yeah and that's very rational why should you choose the study for all the reasons we talked about but for me that point really illustrates uh, continuous learning plus experimentation like the ability to understand that learning is about experimenting it's about failing and trying things it's not about digesting a whole bunch of information and then applying that to something it's about testing those theories that's what the the feedback the world gives you so this the skill of experimenting and the skill of 
coming back from failure. Th- th- these are all things that are taught in gaming theory, not in universities. And uh, th- that's what we're saying. There's a fundamental shift there of the way education needs to change. Yeah, yeah. One of the interviews you were doing with one of our pollinizers, I remember uh, him saying how he was losing and then he came back and won again because he was able to pitch, in his case, he was able to pitch well, you know. And so that experience, like you learn more in that one hour uh, of, of going through that story than slide after slide in a, in a like how, how can you replicate that experience? Mm. How can you teach that kind of resilience and adaptability? These are the words, aren't they, that Sam Altman said? Mm. And so it's obvious when you think about it, the the models of static top-down learning don't allow for that kind of thing and, yeah, the students really feel it. Yeah, and they actually train you in the bad habit of, of not understanding what performance viscerally means because in, in the real world performance comes with risk and so you, you, you learn something within a situation that, uh, that you need to perform within mm. and that has, that has, uh, that has tangible outcomes and a, a visceral feeling. You, you know if you stuff up. Uh, you know, in in a, in a number of ways. So we see it a lot in 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 these students that are coming through. That they've learned in such a passive way that any time they're asked to perform, they can't perform. Yeah. Because they don't. Un- they, their brain switches off when it when it comes under a level of stress. But that's yeah. what life is. It's performance under stress. If you're not learning in those conditions, how can you then train for the real world? It's impossible. Yeah. This is a good point. You know, not only are skills missing, but training the wrong things in the wrong way. I'll give you a very specific example as a software developer. In university, you're really encouraged to build what's called clean code, like really elegant, find a good solution that's minimal, um, document it well, make sure it's clean, and then you get assessed on that. And you'll, you'll get a higher mark if you create a perfectly crafted piece of elegant code. It's called clean code. So these schools are pumping out software developers that can write clean code. No one in business needs clean code. There's some benefits to having good code, but what you need is someone who can build just the right level of good code to get the job done, learn from it, adapt, work in a team, communicate. We talk about these things all the time. And what I end up getting sometimes as an employer are Students who have trained themselves on building perfect code and then come out in the real world and try to build perfect code in my team. And there's nothing more damaging to a software team than a perfectionist software developer who wants to build that perfect piece of code that they did in class. It's the worst possible thing. It costs your business thousands of dollars, friction, and we've experienced that. There's an example where the university is actually not just not trained skills but they've actually trained badly mm. like now they've created a problem for yeah, me super interesting. as an employer mm. you know so i if i was hiring software developers i just go straight to github now i look at what what are they doing yeah and i don't even look at the code that much uh i look at what are they doing mm. like have they thought of something built it finished it um have other people used it mm. are they battle tested are they battle tested and you can be and this is a great industry because in technology you can be battle tested at the age of 15 Mm. nothing's stopping you right there are no barriers yeah so yeah i've really changed you know my view on technical education because of those experiences yeah awesome uh so in this last 10 minutes let's wrap up and summarize what we're talking about so we're obviously quite passionate about this idea that university is a scam and it's it's separate from uh it's visceral for us because we deal with the cohort that are experiencing this and that's that's where this energy comes from for us is the is the idea that the conversations we have on the daily with university students who are our our pollinizers that they're so dissatisfied with with their process they're so dissatisfied most of them, they, they don't even know that it's a problem. They just accept university as, as being that way. They're just so disengaged. Totally yeah. disengaged. And, yeah. it's, and somehow they, uh, they, they deal with that on a, on a daily basis and it's, it's normalized in a sense. Everyone's having this experience. And there's a, just to conclude, I want to sort of look to the future and say 
what is the future? H- how can university turn things around? Is it possible for them to turn around and change this this situation? Uh, and if so, what kind of timeline are we looking looking at? So universities should become research institutes. They should firewall that off. Um, there's huge value there. The you know the things that are sending people to the moon or you know the the research that's going to fire up a green revolution and energy revolution things like that research is critical and universities have a real role there the other side of university my opinion they should turn it into a social experience they should do what we're doing we should bring people together you know one of the reasons to come to university is going to be if we play a polonized game in the university campus you'll want to come to university mm-hmm. because that experience is great but turn the, be Honest with your customers, you know. Uh, come here for the connection. We can connect you to a great community. There's a role there. There are huge investments in infrastructure and these buildings and these beautiful gardens and parks in prime land in every city on earth. These places have value in other ways and they should be places of connection, uh, of innovation, of, of autonomous, you know, social interaction for students. But don't pretend that you can give them the knowledge and learning and the skills that they need to proceed in life. They can do that themselves. You can have a role there but you don't know what they what they want and you don't understand the world in the, the way they do. So I think there's a future but it's a very different future than what they're selling now. And so what is their core problem to solve there in terms of if, if they were to become research, primarily research institutes, they would still have to be – treated or treat the students like any other business does they they need to find that talent in other ways because if the re, as a research institute they draw on their university students as their talent market to bring into those research oh, more institutes. than that they, that's the cash cow the mm-hmm. economic model of university doesn't work unless you just stay in the existing model and and pump students through as you were saying so the fundamental problem is always the same isn't it the world changes very very fast and if you don't change, you die. But to change is very painful. Mm. There's no change that is not painful. And this would be a particularly painful one with huge uh, harmful effects across all kinds of employees, cohorts, um, disruptions, um, real fundamentally things that will break a lot of eggs to make the next omelette. Yeah. But it's not a choice. It makes it's me happening. think of um, what Peter Diamata says with their exponential organizations. He's, he was saying that with the experiments they've run with big corporations, in order for those large corporations to change, they had to create little outlier uh, communities uh, or teams on the edge of the organizations that didn't exist within the immune system of that organization to experiment and create different products and services to then bring into the bigger company and and that's how they were innovating. That's how these bigger organisations were dealing with these rapid changes. So I wonder if that's possible on a university level uh, to change these bigger organisations. Do they need to sort of fraction off into smaller smaller sections? It's Yeah, there's th- they've got some serious problems to solve. They do. I mean they could create a polonise. Yeah. Mm, they, they could, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's that's a good question. Let's talk about the competition. What, what are universities competing with these days? They've got a whole uh, – obviously it's majorly online world but you have you have s- some serious uh, different potential streams and channels that a student could engage in with the idea of how do I – if you take simply the premise that I need to make money to survive and then you take that to the next level which is, well, I want to do something I love to make money in, in order to survive – there's actually there's never been a better time to be alive in order to fulfill that primary 100%. that primary goal. Yeah. Uh, you can essentially do anything and monetize it these days, and that's I think is the most empowering thing out of this is that take away the idea of university gets you a job and think about it in an entre- un- entrepreneurial spirit, which is how do I monetize something that I love in order to survive and be sustainable? And if you look at it from that abundance mindset. Every, the world, the entire yeah. world is your oyster. Yeah. You've got to take that mindset of what I call the third way. There's a stream of education which has always been there, which is highly, highly practical all the day from the days of making spears through to blacksmiths to being a mechanic or whatever it is now. 
that world will always be there has immense value. There's this thing called a university education, which as I point out, I think will become increasingly cerebral and specialised to academic type people who want to do research, who want to engage in that way. What is the third way? It's already happening. It's essentially this autonomous, technology-driven, exponential way of learning where you get to choose your own adventure. You use those exponential technologies to very quickly build the career that you really, really want and constantly change that all the way through your life. As we build this third way at Polonize, others around us in this ecosystem, then we, we will be just sucking energy away from the university sector. They can't compete because they can't move fast enough to build this. It's impossible. I really believe it's impossible. They can try but we'll, they will get out competed at the edges. Does that mean they'll die? Die? Probably not because at every revolution existing models do survive but they're almost unrecognisable afterwards. You can see that in the industrial revolution. You can see that in the digital revolution. So we're going through that now. Um, I think it's just incredibly exciting and as we keep pointing out, it's happening. It's not something we're talking about in the abstract. It's the, the, the students are doing the third way already. They're putting the technologies together in their basements, in their parents' houses, in their garages, just like every re revolution. It always starts like that. They're the ones – they're putting the tools together, making amazing music. They're putting the things together and creating code. They're – creating content and building communities. They're monetizing those communities. They're learning all sorts of science on their own. They're um, doing maths at the high level that is unthinkable in the education system normally, you know. These stories are what inspires us and all they need is a chance. All they need is someone to say, yes, that is a valid way to live your life and not only that, you can succeed and you can be happier than – and more successful this way. So in some ways just identifying it and saying, yes, this is the thing. This isn't a waste of time. You're not sitting and doing YouTube or just gaming or mucking around with code. And These things are not distractions from this big serious thing called education. They are education. That's all they need. So that's the future, which is user-centric, passion and purpose-driven experience. That's the game.